uh, marijuana and derivatives as, as anti-epileptic drugs. And unless you've been living in a cave for the last year, everybody's been hearing about marijuana for epilepsy because it, you know, with the Proposition 3, the approval of marijuana for recreational and medical that was voted down, if, uh, if you ever watch TV, you saw plenty of ads that had uh, several, I think two different young uh, children who had seizures and what they were doing. So let me just jump into it. So, marijuana for epilepsy, this is actually a warehouse in England where they're growing high CBD marijuana. This is from the company GW that now has a trial of, a, of, a, of an extract from marijuana called CBD cannabidiol. But this is an actual picture out of their warehouse. So, this all started with a small group of patients and parents. Uh, and then it was kind of hyped up by the media. So I, I just want to give you an idea that, that there's probably something here for people with epilepsy, but I think it's been hyped up a lot. And what I'm going to try to do is sort of give you at least the evidence of what we have and, and what we think. So it started with a small series of patients and single patient reports in kids with Dravet syndrome. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but this is a, a pretty rare, very severe epilepsy syndrome in young children um, where they can have hundreds of seizures in a week, sometimes even in a day. Um, and it's a, it's a terrifying thing, and they usually don't respond very well to medications. In fact, some of the regular seizure medications can make these kids with Dravet worse. Uh, so it's a horrible thing if you're a parent. So there was some things on the internet about high CBD, um, and some of these parents, including the parents of Charlotte Fiji, so if you've heard of Charlotte's Web, Charlotte Fiji was a girl who had Dravet's who moved to Colorado, whose parents moved her to Colorado to get it. Um, and what they were working with is extracts, marijuana extracts with high CBD or cannabidiol content. Now, the media has been all over this and social networks have been all over this, so lots of people have been going to Colorado. I think um, the, uh, the Charlotte's Web group has like a one year wait so if you get on the list today, it's a year before you get Charlotte's Web, which is their special um, CBD concoction. Now, on the other side is, are the recent cases that have been reported. So Denver Children's Hospital, which is obviously in Colorado where marijuana is approved and you can get marijuana anywhere uh, for recreational or medical, that a lot of the kids who came into the hospital who had been treated with cannabidiol or with other marijuana extracts actually did worse. So some of them did better, but not everybody did better, and some of them did worse. Now, that was not a controlled study, so some parents may have said, oh, I want to put my kid on marijuana, and I'm going to get rid of these horrible seizure medicines that are causing all these side effects. So who knows you know, whether they were pulled off the regular drugs, put on marijuana, but some of them clearly got worse, and, and worse in a bad way. Some of these kids were in what's called status epilepticus, which is a life-threatening um, continuous seizure state. So this is not something I think that people want to jump into right away and we want to, we want to look at it in a very careful uh, research way to try to figure out do these medicines work and who do they work in and what are the side effects. So cannabis in general has, um, it's the plant, everybody's familiar with the plant derived uh, and it has a number of different compounds. So the main one is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and THC is what gives people the high, so that's what people like. So when you go to Colorado and you say, you know, I want to get the most powerful pot that's going to get me as stoned as I can be, um, you get the stuff that's high THC. CBD, or cannabidiol, is another component of the marijuana, probably the second most pop, biggest component, and CBD is um, not thought to make people high, and it's thought actually to be somewhat of a mood stabilizer, and it, many people think that at least some of the medicinal properties of marijuana come from the CBD. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones, cannabivarin is one, and there's actually 30 or 40 other compounds when you look in um, just a plant, uh, and, and especially if you smoke it, there's all kinds of derivatives that come out of there. Okay, so what's interesting though is that there actually are cannabinoid receptors in the brain. There's something called a cannabin CB1 and CB2, and these are specific receptors in the brain on nerve cells that respond specifically to usually THC. So the brain 
is wired actually to respond to cannabinoids. And then you can make synthetic cannabinoids. So you can just go to the, um, the laboratory and you can synthesize THC. So there's a drug, and I'm going to talk about it in a second, called Marinol, which is approved by the FDA to treat um, nausea and appetite loss with cancer chemotherapy or with AIDS. And that's a synthetically produced THC called Marinol, which is available by prescription in the United States. So again, um, THC and CBD have different effects. So THC, as I said, produces a high. You don't get much high with cannabidiol. There's more psychiatric side effects. So if you take people who have a susceptibility to psychiatric side effects, like people with a history of schizophrenia, and you give them THC, they will get very ill, and they will hallucinate. And even some people who've never had that will hallucinate or get very psychotic with THC. Uh, whereas CBD doesn't seem to do that. And as I mentioned, it's Marinol. And then the, the drug that is being developed, with, which is a pure CBD, I'm going to talk about in a second, is called Epidiolex. And the THC may not be critical for treating epilepsy, although there's a subgroup of people who think you've got to do this combination. It's this entourage effect. If you've heard, if you've watched any of the shows, people talk about the entourage effect, that you're going to only get the effect when you combine THC and CBD. That remains to be proven. Um, most people, though, at least we hope, because, you know, it's, I'm not interested in, I, I give people seizure medicines with plenty of side effects. I don't need ones that make people high and make them, you know, reduce their, their, uh, their motivation and, uh, you know, have a potentially addicting properties. I mean, that's the last thing I want, even if it works. I don't want a drug that does all those other things, and that's what's sort of attractive about the CBD, because it doesn't seem to do those things. So as I mentioned, here's Marinol. It's FDA approved, and it's synthetic THC, and it's a Schedule 3, and it's just little pills look like that. Um, and in clinical trials, when people had AIDS um, or, deep, or nausea due to cancer chemotherapy, it helped reduce some of that nausea. <coughs> some people have said it doesn't work as well as smoking pot. I, you know, I don't know, but, but there are a number of people who've had cancer cancer chemotherapy who said smoking pot was way better. In fact, one of my patients who has seizures came to ask me about cannabinoids. Well, I mean, she was at the regular visit, and her husband had had lung cancer, and he said, look, I tried that Marinol stuff, I tried all this other stuff, somebody came over to my house with a joint, I took one hit, he said my nausea was gone. I said, I, you know, one case, so I, I don't know. Um, but in the Marinol studies, about 24% of people got you know, had a feeling of high, easy laughing, elation, heightened awareness, but about 3 to 10 percent also had a lot of anxiety and nervousness, confusion, hallucinations, or even paranoid reactions. So even synthetic THC, the Marinol, can produce this in a small number of people. Actually, if you read the package insert for this, it says seizures may be a side effect of Marinol. Now, I don't know how many cases of seizures they saw during the study, and that doesn't always mean anything, because there's Seizures are a risk, listed as a risk in lots of different drugs. It just means that in the clinical trial, somebody had a seizure. Whether it was due to the Marinol or not, I think we don't know. Um, but what they said with Marinol, though, is that this chronic abuse thing, decrements in motivation, cognitive problems, weren't really seen with Marinol, which is kind of surprising because those are the main things of THC. And then the most important thing, not the most, but one of the big important things is what about long-term use of something like THC in a child? You know, you have these kids with lots of seizures. Seizures aren't good. Anti-epileptic drugs aren't good. But we know THC and marijuana aren't good. What about taking a five-year-old kid and putting them on marijuana every single day for the next 10 years? What's that going to do to their brain long-term? We, we have to learn about that, and we have to worry about it. There, this is another um, uh, marijuana derivative from the same company, GW. It's approved in Europe. It's not approved yet in the United States, but it's a, it's a spray. You actually spray it in your mouth. You can see this person, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but it's, a, it's just a little bottle with a spray. You spray it in your mouth, just like an inhaler kind of thing. Um, and it's used for spasticity and multiple sclerosis. And this one is a mixture of THC and CBD. It's never been tested in epilepsy, um, only been tested in multiple sclerosis. So this is Epidiolex. This is the study that we're doing now. We're one of um, 18 centers or so around the country that's doing a study on Epidiolex. 
it's a purified cannabidiol. So it's plant-based. They grow these special strains of marijuana that are high in CBD and low in THC. Then they extract it, the CBD out, and then they purify it. So it's about 98% pure CBD, and it has almost no uh, measurable THC at all. So again, it's, the idea is it's going to be the medicinal part and not the, not the, uh, the recreational part. So it's dissolved in oil. So this is how it's provided in these bottles like that. So you put a syringe on top and you draw out the liquid inside, which is it's actually sesame oil. Um, so it has kind of an unusual flavor. For the, I, I'm allergic to sesame oil, so it's like, um, like really allergic to sesame oil. So we're, we're kind of laughing that I'm doing a study where if I just touch the bottle, I might get sick. Um, but, but you draw it up and then you squirt it in the mouth. And so it's kind of an oil-based thing. So you, it's, it's, most people, depending on the weight in the study, you would get maybe like a, like a shot glass is 30 cc. So you might get a third of a shot glass of oil twice a day if you were going to get this. Whether or not, when, when it gets FDA approved, or if it gets FDA approved, whether they would put it into capsule form or something else, I don't know. But right now, this is how it's being um, provided. So the study that we're doing is in a syndrome called Lennox-Gastaut. And I don't want to get into too much detail, but I want to give you a couple of ideas about what it's like. So it's an uncommon syndrome, but we, in, as epilepsy specialists, we see it a lot. A lot of different seizure types, and they usually start in childhood, most commonly before the age of four. It's named after two famous epilepsy specialists, like um, William Lennox, who was an American epilepsy specialist, and Henri Gastaut, who was a French epilepsy specialist. And they kind of, de they kind of described this syndrome around the same time, so it became known as Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. These um, children and adults have drop seizures, lots of different kinds of seizures. They can have drop seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, atypical absence, which are these longer staring spells, Seizures are very frequent and hard to control. It's usually considered one of the most difficult epilepsy syndromes to control. And the EEG has a very characteristic pattern called a slow spike wave. So they get a spike wave discharge that's between 1.5, usually and 2.5 cycles per second. So it, what, what's called the, the absence or petty mile spike wave is three per second. And so this is slower than the three per second spike wave of absence. Uh, the other thing is most patients actually have some degree of developmental delay, what we now call intellectual disability, so they're cognitively not, some can be normal, but the average person who has Lennox Gastaut has some kind of cognitive impairment. And, but the problem is that there's a lot of different underlying disorders that can cause this. So people can have cortical dysplasia, they can have tuberous sclerosis, they can have encephalitis at a young age, but, and they all would fulfill the criteria for Lennox Gastaut. So it's not one disease really, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a general category. And then Dravet's is a very separate thing. So Dravet, um, also named after a French uh, neurologist, a woman, uh, it's a rare syndrome. These kids develop seizures before the age of one. They usually start with fever and then they have seizures anytime. And they can become very frequent. The, these are the ones that can be hundreds each week and have lots of different types, myoclonic seizures, status epilepticus, also associated with developmental delay. But the big thing with Drave is they have a genetic defect in the sodium channel. So the sodium channels are in cells. They let sodium in and out of cells. It's called a channel. And that's how cells communicate and, and pass electrical impulses to one another. Different chemicals come in and out of these little channels in individual cells. So these kids that have Dravet, most of them have this genetic defect where their <coughs> sodium channels are abnormal, which makes them very different than the Lennox-Gastaut, which is lots of different things can look like Lennox-Gastaut, but most of the kids who have Dravet have a very specific kind of problem. And then the key here is that a lot of, some of the seizure medicines can actually make seizures worse in kids with Dravet, probably because these medicines work on sodium channels, and the sodium channels in these kids are abnormal, so you've got a sodium channel drug that's trying to work on a normal sodium channel, but it's really working on an abnormal one. So um, Epidiolex, the company GW, which is a British company, is now studying Epidiolex. There's three separate studies. There's one in adults with Lennox Gesto, so 18, age 18 and over, kids with Lennox Gesto under the age of 18, and then the third one is in Dravet. So these studies are going on all around the United States. 
in the Lemix Gasteau study that we're doing, they have to have a, a, at least eight seizures per month. And then there's three groups. They either get kind of a medium dose Epidiolex, a higher dose Epidiolex, or placebo. And what's interesting is um, this is one of the other issues with people who go to Colorado and use um, Charlotte's Web. You really have no idea what the concentration of CBD is because they're just kind of growing it, extracting it, doing a little bit of purification, testing, um, and then they give it to you. In this one, we know exactly how many milligrams of, of uh, cannabidiol is in every single cc in every bottle and how much people are actually getting. And what one of the people from GW said to me is that um, these doses of, of CBD are significantly higher than most of the doses that people are getting, like with Charlotte's Web in, um, in Colorado. What? So here's what it looks like. You have a patient with uncontrolled seizures and they have no change in their current medication and then they either get 10 milligrams per kilogram. So if somebody, for example, who's 175 pounds would get 400 milligrams twice a day. Um, some of the people will get 20 milligrams per kilogram. That would be 800 milligrams a day. Or they get placebo. So you, get, you have a one in three chance of getting placebo, one, one in three chance of getting the 10 milligram, one in three chance of getting the 20. And then you get the same treatment for two months or three months, and we see what happens to your seizures compared to what they were like at baseline. So we're going to measure how much the seizures are reduced, we're going to measure all the side effects, and then you also have to measure levels of other medicine. For example, one of the other issues is drug-drug interactions. So on the clobazam, which is a relatively new drug, but used by a lot of people, was actually approved for Lennox Gesto. Um, the blood levels of on can actually go up when you treat somebody with cannabidiol. So maybe it's not, you know, in some cases, maybe it's not the cannabidiol that's working. You add cannabidiol and the onfi levels go up. It's just like increasing their dose of onfi. So we're measuring all that stuff and making sure that we understand what cannabidiol is doing in that individual case. Um, the, big, the other big problem that we have with marijuana research is the DEA. The DEA schedules marijuana as what's called a Schedule 1. So there's five different levels of scheduling from DEA. Level 5 means that maybe there's some risk of abuse and some there's drugs like Lyrica, which is one of the anti-epileptic drugs, or uh, uh, a whole bunch of other different ones, Vimpat, Lacosamide, uh, Parampanel, that are scheduled by DEA because they believe that there's some risk of, of, of addiction or habituation or abuse of the drugs. In my mind, it's kind of silly. But the silliest thing is that marijuana is a Schedule one. That's the same as LSD and heroin. Okay? Methamphetamine is a Schedule two. So methamphetamine, according to the DEA, is safer than marijuana. Um, but really, the, the, the Schedule one, what it means is that there's a high risk of addiction, a high risk of abuse, and there's no known medical indication for the drug. So the DEA's position is there is no known medical indication for marijuana, period. And that's why it's a Schedule one. So we're really working, and Schedule 1 makes it very, very difficult to do the research that we want. It took me nine months to get just the licenses to do the Epidiolex study. Okay, it took, it took, we, I had to go through the state of Ohio and get a license called Terminal Distributor of Dangerous Drugs. So that's what I am now. I'm a, I'm a Terminal Distributor of Dangerous Drugs. But I had to get that before the DEA would even come and inspect our site to, make, to give me the Schedule 1 license. Then we had to buy a safe. We have a 600-pound safe that we have to put this, these little bottles of the CBD derivative in. So it's, it's a nightmare doing a study with this Schedule 1. And having the DEA move marijuana from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 would greatly enhance the ease of doing any kind of research, either in epilepsy or other fields. So, uh, we, we are really pushing from the Epilepsy Society and the Epilepsy Foundation on the DEA to try to make a lesser schedule. Um, just a couple of final comments about marijuana from the street versus medical marijuana. Like I said, you know, if you get it from the street or even if you get it from a dispensary in Colorado, you don't know what the concentration is. And with medical marijuana, we know exactly what it is. It's just like your medicine. You know, you wouldn't go to the doctor if you're taking Tegretol. And, and the doctor said, well, you know, I found this Tegretol, and we can get it from Colorado. Um, but sometimes it's maybe not as, pop, not as 
potent. So you can either take four pills a day or five pills a day or six pills a day. Maybe some days you might need seven. So, I mean, you know, you would never do that. You would never do that. But that's kind of what is happening with some of the people, some of the distributors. I think some of them are a little bit better, but still, you don't know exactly what the concentration is. Um, unknown additives. You know, this was something that was happening with marijuana a long time ago. People want to get really high. So people would cut marijuana with PCP or other kinds of drugs to make people more high. That's the last thing you need if you're using it from a medical perspective. And also, you don't know how old it is. Every drug that you get has an expiration date, right? So if you go to Colorado, you, when, did, when was this pot grown? You're not really sure. How long has it been sitting around? You're not really sure. Especially if it's CBD, you know, when, when you have recreational available, nobody wants the CBD. Everybody wants the THC marijuana in Colorado. So just to summarize then, what do we want to know about a seizure medicine? We want to know how does it act? What does it do? And CBD kind of has an unknown mechanism. It may hit the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but some scientists say maybe not. Um, how well does it work? Does it actually help seizures compared to placebo? And the trials are just starting. What does it do in the body? How does the body absorb and eliminate the drug? And CBD actually stays in the body for days to weeks, so we need to uh, understand that. How does it interact with other drugs? As I mentioned, it can increase clobazam. And what kind of side effect profile, both long-term and short-term, does it have? Unknown, but THC has a lot of un undesirable short-term and long-term effects for epilepsy treatment. So, lots of media hype. It has some advantages, has a different mechanism. Not that, you know, it, it interacts some, but not that many drug-drug interactions. Disadvantages, we know it has cognitive effects, abuse potential. We don't know what the long-term effects are, especially in children. There's lots of information that's missing. Um, and we need to do the clinical trials, which is what we're doing now. And actually, I just spoke with the people from the company. And they, they think it's possible that by the beginning of 2018, this drug might actually be FDA approved. We'll see. You know, I mean, the FDA always has different things you need to do. But what you can do now is, number one, support legislation to, to, to lower the classification of marijuana so that we can do the kind of research that we need, and also support the clinical trials. If you see trials that you or somebody you know might be a candidate for, the quicker we can enroll in the clinical trials, the quicker we can get the work done that we need to get done. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.